Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Thoreau, and I'm the president of the Independent Institute. I'm delighted to welcome you all to our evening event. Uh, our program is called the Independent Policy Forum. I see many familiar faces. Uh, for those of you who are new, uh, we hold events here at our conference center in Oakland on a regular basis. Uh, they include lectures, debates, and seminars on many different major issues. And we're delighted this evening to host one of our senior fellows, Alvaro Vargas Llosa, uh, who will be speaking based on his new book called Liberty for Latin America. And I hope that everyone here will get a chance to pick up either the English edition uh, or the Spanish edition, which is called Rumbo a la Libertad. For those of you who are new to the Institute, hopefully you've got a packet about our program. The Institute itself is a nonpartisan public policy research institute. We produce many books like Alvaro's book. We also have a quarterly journal called The Independent Review. This is the current issue. And I know that all of you will be anxious to subscribe after our program is over. But I think you'll find it to be enjoyable and challenging and provocative. The Institute itself is a bit different from the public policy field or the so-called think tank world. Uh, we are an academic research institute. There's no issue we might not address. There's no area of government policy we might not address. But fundamentally, we're interested in trying to get to the truth of the nature and impact of government policy and how best to resolve major social and economic issues. Uh, we invite you to visit our website. You'll find a treasure trove of articles and studies uh, on our website. It's constantly changing and also announcements of upcoming events and media projects. As many of you know, um, just a few years ago, Latin America was thought to be moving toward prosperity. But the euphoria shortly lived, uh, lived out its, its uh, welcome, you might say. From Patagonia to the Rio Grande, the sweeping reforms that promised economic growth had borne little fruit in most parts of Latin America. The question to ask is, why did the reforms of the late 20th century, the 90s, essentially, uh, why did they, who were seen to be a universal model, not live up to the expectations? Why do Latin America's democracies seem to act in many respects like dictatorships? Why do private enterprises seem to be acting as government bureaucracies or government monopolies? What principles must be adopted to bring prosperity to the region and to other regions that are suffering from such abject poverty and less development? This evening, we're delighted to have Alvaro here to diagnose Latin America's deep-seated malady and propose genuine reform, liberalizing and decentralizing its institutions and empowering its 500 million people. Alvaro, as I mentioned, is a senior fellow at the Independent Institute. He's director of a new program that we actually have not formally announced called the Center on Global Prosperity. The center is going to focus on the enormous problem of abject poverty in most countries of the world, including Latin America. Uh, more specifically, Alvaro joined with us a little over three years ago after having to flee from his native Peru with his family as a result of a persecution campaign by President Toledo to smear and silence Alvaro for his having exposed in the media the corruption of the then newly elected Toledo regime. I was contacted by a friend, a mutual friend, about Alvaro's situation and asked if there was anything that we could do. Fortunately, within just a matter of days, we were able to arrange for a special fellowship that enabled Alvaro to come to Oakland and join with us as a fellow and begun work, begin work on the book that we're featuring tonight and other work that he's done for the Institute. Um, I'm very pleased that the man who made this possible is with us tonight. Um, and I want to point out and have him stand up, if you would, Peter Howley. Um, Peter is a member of our board of directors. Uh, Peter has literally been a godsend. He's an entrepreneur. And he understood from the very beginning the, new, the, the really unique importance of Alvaro's work. Peter is a true visionary. 
and we're very grateful for his assistance. None of this would have been possible without Peter. Starting with the release of the Spanish edition of his book this past September, Alvaro has been on an extensive tour for us to Latin America, and the response, quite simply, has been astounding. In city after city, in country after country, he's received major coverage in virtually every newspaper, every magazine, every TV and radio program that has news or public affairs, as well as speaking at all sorts of different kinds of events. The result is that the book has become a bestseller in some Latin American countries. The publisher is having difficulty keeping it stocked in some places. With the recent release of the English edition, just about a month and a half ago, uh, we're now seeking to do the same thing in the US. Most recently, some of you may have seen him on the NewsHour on Friday. There's going to be a feature article about him in the Chronicle within about a week and a half, also in the LA Times, and the reviews are expected in the New York Times and many other places. Um, he originally received his, his bachelor's degree in economics from the London School of Economics. He's been on the uh, board of directors of the Miami Herald Publishing Company. He was also an op-ed editor and columnist for the Herald. He's been a contributor to many newspapers and magazines in the U.S. and around the world. Um, he was host of a weekly TV program called Planeta 3 that was aired in 15 countries. He's been a columnist for many papers. He's the author of eight books, including a bestseller called, and I think some of you have read the book, called Guide to the Perfect Latin American Idiot. <laughs> and he's a recipient of numerous awards, most recently the Freedom of Expression Award from the Organization of, of Ibero-American Journalists. And this is sort of a turn of the events, starting from his persecution in Peru, when it turned out that everything he said was not just validated, but the legal profession and then the journalist profession came out very profoundly on his side. So I'm very pleased to introduce Elvaro Vargas Llosa. Thank you, David, and thank you for being here. Uh, yes, I, I, I came here about three years ago, uh, slightly um, more than that, uh, almost as a rafter. Uh, I, I uh, was a sort of political refugee um, seeking uh, protection and help so I could um, pour down some thoughts and reflections on Latin America on paper. I had been a, a man of action, basically. And I thought it was about time I uh, put down some of those um, conclusions and, 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 and thoughts and, uh, and inspirations I had uh, received from all of these uh, years of action. Um, and uh, uh, in a most unexpected way and surprising way, the Independent Institute uh, came to the rescue. So I will always be uh, grateful to David uh, and to Mary Thoreau for the uh, incredible help they gave me. Um, their uh, um, protection and uh, inspiration and example has been uh, a source of inspiration for me. Uh, my wife, Susanna, and I um, always thought we had the perfect marriage until we met David and Mary, of course, and they have the first claim to that. Um, and they have been also a source of inspiration uh, to all of us. Anybody who values the institution of marriage uh, and knows David and Mary um, uh, is perfectly aware of how much um, they have contributed to that uh, wonderful institution. So thank you, David, thank you. And, and thank you, Mary, also. Um, well, I'm here to talk about Latin America. And I'm, sh I'm sure the very expression Latin America conjures up all sorts of funny expressions. And, and I'm sure many of you are aware that uh, some of the most salient um, traits of Latin America have to do with the uh, monumental growth of the state, with patronage, political patronage, with uh, authoritarianism, with demagoguery, um, with um, uh, all sorts of uh, political abuse uh, of power. And uh, you would be absolutely right in thinking that. Uh, that's exactly the story of Latin America. Um, and it's not a, a, an unfair image. It's, uh, it reflects perfectly what's been going on in Latin America for the last um, hundreds of years. Uh, we've had um, very uh, interesting characters uh, in power, positions of power. Uh, 
Um, we had somebody, a president, um, who said that to live uh, outside of the national budget was to live in error. Um, we had a president um, who was forced to combat a, uh, an epidemic of scarlet fever. And you know the manifestations of scarlet fever have to do with red spots all over your body. And uh, this is a, a president. We had a president who uh, decided to combat scarlet fever by wrapping all the electric towers and, and cables in his country with uh, red paper. Um, uh, we've had a, a, a president, Alvaro Obregón, in Mexico, in the days of the revolution in Mexico, um, who expressed corruption in these terms. He said, well, there's no general, no living general, who could resist a five or 50,000 pesos cannonball. And of course, uh, uh, that, that was absolutely an exaggeration because today you could buy three generals or four generals for that money, uh, <laughs> as, as we discovered in Peru in the 1990s. Uh, we had a Mexican president um, who um, glorified power so much that he decided to uh, hold a state funeral for his own leg, a leg he had lost in a war and then decided to bury that uh, leg with military honors. And believe it or not, there was a million people in the public square um, to follow him for that. Um, so we've, we've had some very interesting characters in, in 200 years of Republican history since we gained independence from Spain and, 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 and Portugal. Um, we've had uh, basically a history of tremendous uh, state power, of authoritarianism, of uh, the belief that authority could solve people's problems. And we basically delegated uh, the responsibility for solving those problems on those who held power. And the result of that has been, of course, that half of the population in Latin America uh, lives in poverty. Uh, and uh, we need to uh, confront this myth uh, head on uh, unless we want to continue for the next few decades to live under the uh, misguided impression that the government is there to solve people's problems. Um, so let me give you a, a basic idea of where I think this is coming from. Um, uh, many of my colleagues here have heard me many times talk about the five principles of oppression, so I'm going to apologize if I have to go into this once more. But it's extremely important to understand where this is coming from, and unless we realize that there have been, um, uh, there's been a, a great deal of stability in Latin America. Uh, most people think that Latin America has been a land of instability, where everything um, is, is very chaotic and, and uh, where institutions don't last very long and governments don't last very long. But my point is exactly the opposite, that beneath that very chaotic surface, what there has been is a, a great deal of stability. Um, we have gone from pre-Columbian to colonial times, from colonial times to 200 years of Republican life. And within those 200 years, of course, we've gone from the left to the right, from the right to the left. And my basic point is we've always, we've preserved uh, uh, the same way of doing things, of organizing society, organizing power, organizing institutions, so that um, all these changes and all that instability is extremely superficial. What we really have is a basic structure of incentives, a basic structure uh, of or organizing human interaction uh, that has survived all these changes of apparent changes of government and institution and structure. Um, so what are those basic fundamental uh, structures? Well, I choose to call them corporatism, state mercantilism, privilege, uh, wealth transfer, and political law. Now, let me briefly explain uh, what I mean by these. Corporatism is when you look at society, not in terms of individuals, but of t in terms of groups. Uh, a very famous uh, Austrian economist called Mises talked about this uh, somewhat differently. Um, he talked about uh, polylogism. Uh, it's an expression he uh, borrowed from uh, a guy called Michael Polangi. Um, and the basic idea was that there was, individuals didn't uh, act according to their own personal individual logic. That what they did is they acted according to the group logic. In other words, uh, according to what group they belong to in society. Uh, this could be a, a race, a nation, 
a class, I mean, whatever, or even a smaller type of group. But whatever they did and thought and whatever motivated them to act was basically uh, something that was structured by the group, the corporation they belonged to. Well, this is a, an extension of that idea. In Latin America, we've always believed that individuals um, have no individuality. They basically respond to whatever group they belong to. And that makes it very easy for governments because uh, that's a very easy way to organize property rights and other types of rights. If you believe that people don't react and act and uh, behave according to their own individual aspirations and ideals, then of, of course you're going to uh, pick certain groups and certain corporations above the rest. And that's how we have organized property rights in Latin America, in pre-Columbian, in colonial, and in Republican times. Uh, we have chosen uh, uh, to organize society so that certain corporations would have certain privileges above the rest of society. Uh, in uh, pre-Columbian times, of course, uh, nobles and priests had certain rights that uh, serfs and laborers didn't have. Uh, why? Because those people were in a position to give back to the state uh, certain uh, funding that uh, ordinary people were not in a position to give back. And in colonial times, 300 years of colonial life, uh, from the 16th to the 19th century, we had exactly the same thing in Latin America. Um, a, a system of government whereby uh, the state uh, simply chose to negotiate with the most powerful corporations uh, certain rights. So in uh, colonial times, it was the owners of sheep in Spain who had a lot of money, money and a lot of power, and they were in a position to exercise influence on government. So they got privilege from government in exchange for funding, and the, of course the Spanish uh, state needed to fund some of its wars in, in Europe. Um, so everybody else in, in the colonies from Mexico to Patagonia, from Mexico to Argentina or Chile, uh, was simply excluded from those rights. So that was corporatism. And that is still a very salient trait of life in Latin America today. Um, if you look at, for instance, what happened in the 1990s in Mexico, you will find that certain corporations were uh, in a, a much more powerful position than the rest of society. Uh, for instance, if you were a bank owner, and you had uh, been given a, a license by the government to own a bank and, and uh, take part in, in that market, um, you had certain privileges. Uh, that's how uh, Mexican governments, Mexican uh, bankers had uh, a very unique position in the 1990s that led them to behave in a very irresponsible way, uh, and that uh, in turn led to a financial uh, crisis which cost taxpayers in Mexico about $70 billion, which is about uh, all of what Peru, which is a country of almost 30 billion, uh, uh, 30 million, sorry, uh, people, uh, produces in one year. Uh, a, a huge financial uh, hole that had to be, of course, uh, uh, covered by uh, Mexican um, taxpayers. Uh, why? Because this was a particular corporation that was in a position to exchange favors, to trade favors with those who were in a position of political power. Uh, just as uh, the Mesta, which was the corporation that uh, was uh, made up of uh, the owners of sheep in Spain in the 16th century, was in a, many centuries before, was in a position to trade favors with the uh, uh, colonial power back then. So we've been basically perpetuating a, a way of doing business in Latin America that's been extremely corporatist. In other words, no individual property rights. Property rights were essentially corporatist. It depended uh, on what uh, group or corporation you belong to, uh, and uh, according to what group or corporation you belong to, you were or were not in a position uh, of power to uh, force the government to recognize some of your rights. The second principle of oppression is what I call state mercantilism. That's when competition doesn't take place uh, in the marketplace. In other words, in the economic uh, sphere. It takes place in the political sphere. You simply compete for uh, uh, influence over the government, uh, for uh, power over the government. Uh, those who are most successful in Latin America are usually those who are closest to power. They have no merit of their own, at least not in the economic sphere. Uh, 
that have not uh, been able to offer a better uh, service of a higher quality uh, or a better prices, but simply people who have been able to extract from government certain recognition, certain concessions, according to how much influence they were able to exercise. So competition is not an economic concept, it's essentially a political concept in Latin America. I know this takes place here, it takes place everywhere. There is political competition everywhere. In Latin America, this is the norm, it's the rule. Uh, this is uh, how most people go about business. Uh, what you learn in university, uh, if you go to college and then to university and, and so on, is not, um, if you are in, in, in this field, is not how to uh, conquer and seduce consumers. It's essentially how to conquer and seduce the smile of a minister. Uh, it's very important in Latin America to be close to power for you to succeed. Um, so this was the situation, for instance, uh, in colonial times when Spain was the only country that was allowed to trade, to engage in commerce with Latin America for 300 years. Can you imagine that? And then in 200 years of uh, Republican life, that's exactly uh, what happened. Uh, just a few years ago, in the 1990s, when Latin America decided to privatize many of its uh, state uh, concerns and government-owned companies, uh, that is exactly what happened. Uh, we decided to privatize those companies according to, uh, well, how much influence certain uh, private groups were able to exercise on government um, so that we created certain <coughs> private monopolies. So some of these companies went from being state monopolies or government monopolies to private monopolies. All the utilities, water and electricity, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, many commercial entities, uh, all sorts of services, and even hotels, I mean, you name it. Uh, Mexico privatized about 1,000 companies. Chile privatized more than 500. Peru privatized more than 200. Uh, Brazil privatized uh, tens of, 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 I mean, even hundreds of companies. Uh, Telebras, which was the telecommunications concern, was privatized for, uh, was sold for about $18 billion. Um, so lots of money uh, were made from, from those transactions. Of course, that was uh, money that was um, received from the government in exchange for something, and that something was monopoly. Uh, those who were paying uh, $18 billion for a company in, in Brazil were forcing the government or asking the government to give them, in exchange for that, monopoly powers. In other words, nobody else had a right to enter that market, to compete in that market. And so although the service became a little bit more efficient, because any private company is usually more efficient than any government-owned company, in general, the population uh, well, received from those uh, corporations and companies a okay service for very, a very high price, very high tariffs. And so uh, what we had uh, two, three years after that was a great disillusionment with the idea of privatization. Uh, people tended to associate privatization with crony capitalism, with very corrupt transactions between government and certain corporations. Uh, the consumer was not the almighty power. Uh, the consumer was basically uh, robbed of all his power and wealth. Uh, and what happened was that certain corporations were in a position of uh, exceptional power and influence in that society, and so uh, people tended to associate privatization with privilege. And that's the third principle of oppression, privilege. Uh, privilege, of course, is, is a word that we use very loosely to describe different types of uh, positions in society, but the uh, purpose of this book, uh, in part, is to persuade you that privilege is a condition generated by government or state power. Um, privilege uh, would not exist if government did not exercise uh, privilege uh, through its uh, legal system in society. Uh, in other words, in Latin America we had, in pre-Columbian times, a system of privilege, of course, whereby um, laborers and serfs were forced to work certain uh, hours of the day uh, in the lands owned by the nobles. Uh, well, that was something that was only possible because the legal system forced uh, those people to, to do so. Uh, in colonial times, the government would simply distribute land among its cronies, uh, land that was owned by 
peasants, uh, indigenous peasants in Latin America. Uh, and then it forced some of these laborers to work uh, some hours uh, of the day or the month or the week uh, uh, in those lands. And, and, and therefore, um, through the use of state, coercive state power, uh, it forced people to redistribute wealth to those who were in a position of power. And in Republican times, we've had exactly the same type of situation. Uh, we even have it today. Uh, for instance, uh, labor laws in Latin America, all over Latin America, from Mexico to Argentina, are laws that essentially entrench privilege. Uh, if you go to Argentina, you will see that there are uh, laws of uh, collective bargaining uh, that force you to imitate some of the laws that were passed by Mussolini in Italy half a century ago, or even more than that. Um, for instance, if, if you... Um, produce uh, uh, or manufacture submarines in, in Argentina, you have to follow exactly the same rules uh, as if you produce nails. Uh, why? Because there's a, a, a collective bargaining by trade. And uh, anything that has to do with metal, according to them, uh, has to be bound by exactly the same rules. Uh, so there's no individual relationship with a company. There's no transaction between or negotiation between an individual and, and the employer or the company he or she uh, works for. There is a, basically a bureaucratic system under which anything that has to do remotely with that type of trade is bound by the same laws. Not that bureaucrats uh, uh, produced or uh, created today, but created 50 years ago or 60 years ago. Um, so you have a system of privilege because, of course, that leaves out of the market uh, millions of Argentinians. That's why unemployment is so high in Argentina. Uh, even in the 90s, when $100 billion were invested in Argentina, $100 billion of American and European money were invested in Argentina, Argentinian uh, unemployment was about 18 to 20%. I mean, how come if $100 billion are being invested in Argentina, which is about as much as Argentina produces today in one year, it's a lot of money, how come there was so much unemployment? Well, because labor laws created an entrenched privilege. And uh, of course, in doing so, they discriminated against, they excluded from opportunity most Argentinians. Uh, and so privilege has been another uh, extremely important a pillar of oppression in Latin America. The fourth principle of, of oppression is what I call wealth transfer. Uh, and that consists basically of decoupling distribution from uh, production. And this is, of course, something that also happens here, happens everywhere. Uh, politicians and, and states and governments uh, think that these are two different processes. Uh, we produce wealth and then we distribute it so that we are fair. It's a fair society. It's a society that's equalitarian, that's uh, in a position um, to uh, overcome some of these uh, uh, unjust uh, forms of distribution that the capitalist system um, produces. Um, however, if you dissociate, if you decouple the system of production from the system of distribution, what you're going to do is you're going to kill distribution. You essentially are going to create a system of disincentives that are going to um, uh, expel producers from your country. And that's why in Latin America in the 1980s, uh, about $250 billion uh, worth of capital fled the continent, uh, which is about four times as much money as the IMF was um, handing out to the entire developing world in that decade. Uh, so just it, it gives you an idea of how utterly inefficient and absurd the whole idea of foreign aid is. Foreign aid pouring into Latin America, which is money probably paid from your taxes, uh, pouring into Latin America. And that money was going out the back door because people simply didn't think those laws and institutions and systems of government um, were uh, uh, conducive to a prosperous economy, economy that would secure some of your property rights and allow for uh, accumulation of capital. Um, so we have a system of distribution that in essence kills the whole purpose of distribution because it, it doesn't allow for the production, the continuous production of wealth and therefore the accumulation of wealth that will eventually allow for that uh, wealth to be 
distributed throughout society. It, it simply defeats its own purpose. Uh, and so we've had a situation that in Latin America has again perpetuated the old way of doing things. Uh, in pre-Columbian times, we had wealth re redistribution. Uh, when the Incas and the Aztecs forced uh, Peruvian and Mexican laborers um, to work and pay tribute uh, to nobles and priests uh, working in their lands, uh, that was a way of uh, redistributing wealth, of redistributing the energy of society to the uh, top layer of society, which was, of course, a privileged top layer of society. Uh, in uh, colonial times, we had exactly the same thing. The government would uh, redistribute the peasants' lands to some of its cronies, people who were usually born in Spain or Portugal and came to Latin America. Uh, and then they would force laborers and serfs to work part of the time in those uh, lands, and so uh, use their energy uh, for purposes other than their own interests. Uh, and again, that was a way of redistributing wealth, but not from the uh, top down, as demagogues uh, usually uh, uh, promise, but exactly the opposite way, from the bottom up. People who were very poor were giving up their energy and work time and um, uh, imagination and creativity for the sake of those who were in a position of power, who owed their wealth and position not to their merits, but uh, simply to the power of the state. Well, today we have exactly the same situation in Latin America. Uh, we have a system that redistributes wealth from the consumer to, not to all the producers, but to a very small group of producers. For instance, if you live in Brazil or Uruguay or Argentina or Paraguay, um, well, you saw some of your tariffs go down in, in the early 90s, uh, which was not a bad thing. They were trying to open up trade. Uh, and then you saw very uh, soon those tariffs go back up again. Why? Because these governments created regional blocks. We created the South American common market and the Andean common market and the Central American common market and so on and so forth. And so um, the governments uh, chose to redistribute wealth, not from the top down, but exactly the opposite way, from the bottom up. Uh, and so in Argentina, for instance, uh, 71 out of 97 different groups of items, in other words, most of the economy, uh, saw their tariffs go up. So huge protectionism in Argentina, just as glossy magazines in the US and Europe were hailing Argentina as a big example of free market economy. Uh, and so they were not really at all aware of what was going on. They didn't realize that the government in Argentina was growing at a, at a huge, unsustainable rate. In the 1990s, uh, public spending in Argentina grew by about 100%. The economy grew about 40%, not bad, but public spending grew at about 100% in the 1990s. And everybody in the world was saying Argent Argentina's government is shrinking. This is the end of government. They're doing away with the state. This is anarchism or anarchy. Well, it wasn't true. Argentina's state was growing and growing and growing. And what was the consequence of that? Well, at the end of 2001, they defaulted on the debt. Big chaos. And so today we have a situation in which Argentina has decided not to pay back its debt. The U.S. has no, I mean, no choice but to simply accept that. The IMF, the World Bank, everybody is accepting that as a fact of life. Uh, but the origin of that was the growth of the state in the 1990s, just as everybody in the world thought the Argentinian state was shrinking. So that was wealth transfer. A, a system uh, of complete delusion in which we all think we are distributing wealth to the poor, and really what we're doing is exactly the opposite. We're taking away from the poor their wealth, their creativity, their spirit, really. And we're simply channeling that towards a small group of people that are very close to power. And then finally, we have the uh, principle of political law. And this is um, really what makes the other four principles of oppression possible. Political law is a system uh, which uh, basically makes whoever is in a position of power the origin of the law. In other words, the law is not above the government, above the state, is not a uh, general abstract principle to which uh, every government uh, is subject, but whatever the government chooses it to be, 
Uh, and that was the story of pre-Columbian times, of course, Incas and Aztecs in Mexico, in Peru, uh, decided that the law was whatever they thought it was. It, their whims were the law. Uh, in colonial life, we had a million laws passed by Spain, literally a million laws in 300 years. Can you imagine that? A society governed by a million laws. Uh, of course, those laws were contradictory. Uh, if I told you, you know, you have to abide by a million laws before you came into this room, it would be impossible for you to pay any attention to what I was saying. You would spend most of your time trying to figure out what the law was. And you would realize the law was totally chaotic, contradictory, absurd. Uh, it it d dealt with the most minute details of your life. Well, that was what, li what, what the law was like in uh, colonial times. And so it was very interesting. A divorce took place between uh, the official institutions of government and real life. So even the people who were supposed to enforce those laws came up with this wonderful saying, and they said, uh, I will uh, obey but not comply with the law. What does that mean? Well, I don't know what that means. But that, that was a saying that was very famous uh, uh, during colonial times. I will obey but not comply with the law. Well, that is still the case in Latin America today because we got rid of Spain and Portugal in the early 19th century. But since then, we have passed another half million laws in most countries in Latin America. 200 years of Republican life, half a million laws. Can you imagine that? On top of a million, of course, we didn't repeal the million laws that were passed before that. We simply, it was, it's a new layer of uh, uh, norm normative production. So we simply don't know what the law is. We have no idea, not a clue what the law is. And so people today still think we need to obey but not comply with the law. What's the consequence of that? The informal economy. 60% of the workforce in Peru produces uh, uh, you know, in the shadows, uh, outside of the law of the legal system, a certain amount of wealth. They only produce about 25, 30% of the wealth because it's not very productive. Of course, if you operate outside of the law, it's very hard to be productive. You don't have the protection, the security of the law. Uh, but it simply means that most of the country is operating outside of the legal system. Um, you have a situation in which, uh, in Brazil, every year, half a million people are leaving the Catholic Church and moving on to different evangelical cults, Protestant churches, uh, because they think Catholic, the Catholic Church is part of the legal system. You have a situation in which in almost every election in Latin America today, there is an outsider, a dark horse candidate, who in the last few weeks of the campaign emerges as a very strong candidate. Nobody knows where he or she is coming from. Usually it's a he, but soon it will be a she, I'm sure. Nobody knows where they're coming from. They have no political party, no... Uh, history. Uh, it's simply a rebellion on the part of the people against state power. Of course, this can turn out very sour, as we learned in Peru in the 1990s with Fujimori. Uh, he was a dark horse candidate. He came out of nowhere. He won the elections and he became a dictator. He engineered a coup um, and we have never had as much corruption as we had in the 1990s. But I'm, I'm really not getting at that. The point I'm getting at is um, it's a way in which society expresses its total aversion to repulsion against the state, the law, official institutions, anything that represents or claims to represent society. It's the way we have chosen um, to um, take revenge on the institutions of government after 500 years of oppression. Uh, and so although these are uh, expressions that usually um, are, uh, reveal a very sinister uh, and very, uh, of course, awkward uh, state of mind, they are also extremely genuine. It's what people have chosen to do, simply to survive and to rebel against that oppression. Um, however, the result of all of this is poverty. That's why Latin America today uh, is a poor continent. Half of the population is in a state of poverty. Uh, we have a situation uh, in which, uh, if you look back uh, at history, uh, you will realize that in the 100 years ago, Latin America had a per capita income that was about uh, the equivalent of 29% of the per capita income of the United States, if you take uh, into account purchasing power uh, parity. Uh, and today, it's about the same. 
we've made no progress in 100 years. Um, uh, and in some cases, it's even worse. Argentina in the early uh, 1900s was a very developed country. It's a country into which many uh, Europeans would migrate. Um, their uh, per capita income was about the equivalent of 70% of the per capita income of the United States. Not bad at all. It was a country that was really, it was one of the uh, 11 or 12 most developed countries in the world. And that country um, has today a per capita income that's about the equivalent of 24, 25% of the per capita income of the United States. So can you imagine from almost 70% to 24%? Uh, Venezuela, in the 1950s, um, because of oil mainly, but still uh, had a per capita income that was almost 70% of the per capita income of the United States. Today it's about 24%. Um, so we have a situation in which most countries have stayed exactly the same and other countries have gone down. Uh, and uh, today Latin America is one of the uh, poorest uh, areas and regions of the world. We have a per capita GDP that is three times higher than China's, six times higher higher than uh, India's, uh, and still we uh, equal the uh, world average in terms of poverty, uh, which means that we have half the population in a state of poverty. How is that possible? If we have a higher per capita GDP than China and India, which are huge countries that are factored into this equation, how come we, have, we equal the world average, which also includes Africa, of course? Well, it simply means that um, any uh, uh, progress there is in Latin America uh, only affects, only benefits a very small proportion of the population, a very small section of the population that is globalized, that is in a position to, uh, of course, uh, import much of the technology and, and capital that, are, that is around. Uh, and then the rest of the population simply has no access uh, to that world. Um, today, um, in a country like Peru, 2% of uh, all corporations and companies produce about 65% of the wealth. So can you imagine that? 98% of the corporations and companies, mostly small and mid-sized companies, uh, produce about 30, 35% of the wealth. So they don't produce very much. Um, that's why a, a country like Argentina, an extremely educated country, uh, probably the most educated country in Latin America, uh, more educated than most European countries, uh, I believe, uh, produces eight times less than Spain. They have about the same population, almost 40 million people, and they produce today eight times less than Spain. And if you talk to any Argentinian in the streets, um, they're probably more educated than an average Spaniard. Uh, why? Well, because they have a system, uh, an institutional system, that is simply not conducive to prosperity. Uh, what are institutions? They're basically systems that st help to structure human interaction. Uh, human interaction always, of course, have a certain framework, uh, a certain structure. Uh, and those, uh, that framework, that structure, uh, either helps or doesn't help uh, the creation of wealth. It's a system of incentives or disincentives. In Latin America, we have a system of disincentives. Everything that we do, at least that we do from a position of government, tends to uh, do exactly the opposite of what it purports to do. Uh, it creates a system of disincentives whereby anybody who is in a position to create anything, to contribute anything to society, is immediately dissuaded from doing so because the system is corporatist and mercantilist and privilege-ridden and wealth-transferring and is dominated by political law. So the only way to move ahead in society is to be close to power, to be in a position of privilege, to exclude others from competition and from entry into any market. Uh, and so I think it's about time uh, to look at Latin America not as a place where the left and the right have been um, fighting over um, big, uh, important ideological issues, but as I, a continent where both the left and the right have contributed um, to poverty, uh, where it's about time to undo and dismantle much of what has been done. Uh, this, to, to finish off, I, there's an example I always bring up from history, which I think is extremely inspirational. Uh, in the 18th century in Britain, uh, there was a system in place which was similar to that, um, in that the, the one that's in place in Latin America today, and uh, a very, very 
uh, enlightened group of people called the Whigs. You've probably heard of them, the British Whigs. Not the Whigs from here in the 19th century, but Whigs in Britain in the 18th century. Um, decided to do something extremely courageous. They decided to repeal four-fifths of the legislation that had been passed since Henry III in the 13th century. So almost half a millennium, almost 500 years of laws and norms, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And they simply repealed them. And they liberated the energy of the people. And the result of that was the Industrial Revolution that historians look at today with admiration. Uh, and that was an extraordinary phenomenon from which this country benefited. Much of what happened in the 19th century in this country was a byproduct of that extreme act of courageousness and courage. And I think it's uh, time Latin America uh, went uh, along that um, uh, route. And I think it's very important to understand that real reform is about uh, repealing and undoing and dismantling uh, much of the legacy and heritage of corporatism and state mercantilism and privilege and wealth transfer and political law. And once we have the courage to do that, we will liberate the energy of the people and God knows what the result will be, but it will certainly be a lot better than it's been in these last 500 years of very depressing history. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alvaro. We have uh, time for questions. Um, before we do so, there's another person Check. here who I also wanted uh, to thank. Um, and um, uh, she's Alvaro's partner and Check. wife, Susanna, um, who we've had the privilege of, of getting to know. Um, uh, you can imagine uh, the kind of difficulty it is to relocate um, and the the uh, uncertainty, especially with a young family. So the courage and the support and the integrity and flexibility of Susanna has been indispensable, and I want to thank her for that. So Carl has the microphone, and I'll turn it over to Alvaro to field. Um, if you'd keep your um, point two, a short question, and also hold the microphone horizontal. We get the reception. Stand up. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. It was thank you. Uh, very informative. Um, let me just say, um, I'm, a, I'm an active Catholic in an American mold, which is not the typical mold, I'm sure you realize. Um, how much do you equate the uh, sort of conservative Opus Dei wing of the church, you know, association with the traditional powers and the um, dapping down on um, like liberation theology and things like that, with a couple of exceptions like Oscar Romero and things like that, with uh, the sort of a uh, passive acceptance of what goes on with the governments in Latin America? Well, um, that's a very loaded question. Um, <laughs> The Catholic Church has been part of, I think, part of the problem in Latin America. It may be part of the solution, too. Um, as most of you know, uh, Vatican II, um, many decades ago, um, was an attempt to um, um, kind of bring the church up to date. It was, it was considered to be, the Catholic Church was considered to be very outdated. It was, it was a very conservative and orthodox uh, type of church, and society had moved on, and there had been the counterculture movement in this country. And so there was a big attempt to, to um, bring the Catholic Church up to date. The result of that in Latin America was not an updating of the church. It was simply uh, the, uh, well, liberation theology. It was a Marxist uh, interpretation of religion. And so it was another way of doing exactly what we had been doing, which was to concentrate political power in the hands of a few and to expropriate the interpretation of uh, whatever salvation was uh, so that uh, a very uh, privileged elite of people who were in a position of power oh, could interpret that and uh, enforce that on everybody else. Uh, and so. Uh, what was interesting, it, it, it was that there was a kind of split in the church between the liberation theology people, the left wing of the church, and the uh, Opus Dei, or right wing of the church. And my argument is they had more in common that they were uh, prepared to accept 
Uh, both were very authoritarian wings of the church. Extremely, uh, um, of course, uh, vertical and authoritarian and uh, unable to understand that uh, religion needs to be a very flexible and open concept so that individuals can relate to it in whatever ways they think they need to relate to it. Uh, and so the result was an open war uh, between them in Latin America, and little by little, they started to lose uh, influence and even legitimacy. And that's why many people have been moving to uh, other types of cults and religions, um, evangelical cults, Protestant religions. In my own country, in Peru, that's a huge phenomenon. In Guatemala, a third of the country is now declaring itself uh, Protestant. Uh, Brazil, half a million people. I'm sorry? Oh, I have no idea. We don't know that. <laughs> I, I deeply respect people's beliefs and religion. I mean, I, I, who am I to say that? We, we, nobody is in a position to say whether that's good or bad. It's a political and social phenomenon we need to take into account, and I hope the Catholic Church takes that into account. How would you compare Latin America to Africa, uh, then? And who do you think is going to climb out of their mess faster, Latin America or Africa? Uh, then uh, where are the Taiwans of the future, shall we say? That's a very good question. Well, um, there's a, a, a Venezuelan writer called Carlos Rangel, uh, spelled Rangel, um, who in the 1960s wrote about that. And he said, well, um, he came up with a concept uh, which he called third worldism. And that was basically a word that uh, explained what was happening in both Africa and Latin America. And what was happening was um, some of our uh, ideologues were trying to export Marxism to, to Africa and Latin America um, um, in such a way that uh, it would basically create a sort of outlet for an ideology that had been proven wrong in Europe. Uh, as you know, uh, Marxists had predicted the fall of, of capitalism in Europe and so on and so forth. Uh, that had proven to be absolutely wrong. Uh, capitalism was, was uh, prospering in those countries, despite many uh, manifestations of state power. But that's a wonderful thing about liberty. You give it a little bit of leeway and room, and it'll create wonders and miracles for you. Uh, but it is true that uh, Marxists needed, desperately needed an outlet. Uh, and so uh, that's where they came up with. They came up with this idea that then uh, there would be no cl class struggle within a, same, a, a particular country, but really that there would be a class struggle on the international scale. And so it was, it was going to be a struggle between poor countries and, and rich countries. And so Africa and Latin America were supposed to be the poor countries struggling against the rich countries and we were supposed to overcome capitalism. A uh, hundred years have, have passed, and of course that has not been the case. Um, uh, one of the uh, offshoots of that theory was what I call in my book structuralism. Uh, for about 60, almost 70 years in Latin America, we were uh, governed by that basic idea. The idea that we had to correct the unjust terms of trade between the poor countries and the rich countries. Uh, created by creating all sorts of barriers and nationalizing companies and, and uh, creating tariffs and, and just basically isolating ourselves from the rest of, of the world. And uh, that has uh, only created uh, more poverty for both Latin America and Africa. Um, so I am not in a position to say which of the two regions of the world will, will uh, wake up to reality sooner. Uh, there are some very... Um, um, edifying and uh, important examples in Africa, Botswana being probably the, the best one. Uh, there are some good examples in Latin America, Chile being a very good one. In the last decade or so, Chile, even under a socialist government, has reduced poverty by about 50%. Only 18% of the population in Chile today is considered to be poor, uh, which is not a bad thing for, for Latin American country. It's completely surrounded by uh, lunatics in Latin America, and, so, <laughs> and it's it's not doing it's it's doing pretty well. Uh, so I don't know which one will come out of, of poverty before and 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 will uh, embrace the idea of liberty before, uh, but certainly both uh, have been the victims of this notion that poor countries owe their poverty to the wealth of rich nations, which doesn't uh, mean that rich countries have not engaged in very stupid endeavors and very, the very wrong types of foreign policies. But I refuse to believe that the poverty of uh, poor countries uh, 
uh, is really a consequence of those policies. I think the poverty of these countries is a consequence of their own uh, inadequacies and mistakes, and uh, therefore it's perfectly possible to uh, reverse uh, that course if we make the right type of choices. Please. Uh, this. Very much. Very much. Can can we Mike, over here first? Just wait. You all hear me? Yeah. 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 I can hear you. I can hear you. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Your both your book and your talk. Thank you. And as a generalization of Latin American condition, you have described it very very well. However. I was, I was waiting for that, however or but. <laughs> Thank you. However, I'm based, like you, I'm basically an optimist. I'm looking for positive examples of success in economic development and economic reform. And uh, just a moment ago, you mentioned Chile to be at least a partially successful. And uh, my wife and I recently visited Costa Rica. And uh, we were surprised to learn that since 1948, they abolished the army. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, they laid on sank the sank in the, the socialism and so on. Uh, but there must be different degrees of success and failure. Could you give us some hope to see where the successes are? Absolutely. That's a very good question. I am extremely optimistic. I have seen, in my lifetime, I have seen New Zealand uh, come out of poverty uh, because there was a guy, a finance minister called uh, Roger Douglas, who had a very simple, clear, and truthful idea. He said the objective uh, is really to abolish, uh, abolish privilege. Uh, he has been asked time and time again, what's the secret of New Zealand's success? And he said, we simply decided to abolish privilege. We went into every single market and decided, well, this is where the state is creating privilege. This is where the state is discriminating against certain people. This is where the state is creating barriers to entry. This is where there isn't real competition. This is where the consumer is not the real, the almighty power. And he abolished privilege in one market after another. He has not, of course, gotten rid of government altogether, but he's gone a long way towards liberating the people from the dead weight of government. Uh, and the result is that in every statistic in the world, New Zealand is one of the most uh, prosperous countries. Uh, that's a huge achievement. It, it was done in one generation. A uh, hundred years ago, that would have been impossible. In today's world, it's possible for a generation um, to achieve that result uh, in 15 years. Um, the Czech Republic, uh, 15 years ago, it had gone through the experience of communism. Uh, very few Latin American countries have gone through that experience, of course, very few. Uh, and um, it's humiliating for Latin Americans today to learn that um, almost every single former communist country in Central and Eastern Europe um, has an economic situation, uh, which you can measure in different ways, including per capita income, that is way above the average Latin American situation. Uh, the Czech Republic um, is one uh, case in point. Uh, Slovakia. Do you remember when the Czech Republic and Slovakia split up? Most people said, the Czech Republic is going to do well, Slovakia is going to go down the drain. Well, today, Slovakia is a country that's being spoken of with admiration throughout the world. Uh, do you remember Ireland? The only thing they exported was people. <laughs> that's all they exported, people. This country was made up in part by Irish people. Uh, they export everything today. I mean, they are really in an incredible situation. And they have not, um, I mean, it's a revolution, I guess, but they have a long way to go. I mean, the government is still interfering with, with, with society. Uh, but in the last 15 years, Ireland has removed many of the barriers, uh, and they're, they're doing pretty well. Uh, uh, so Estonia is a country that decided in 1990, they decided we're going to go for radical trade reform. Trade reform was, I mean, they didn't need to uh, sign treaties like the NAFTA treaty, which is uh, about uh, a 1,000 pages long. You know what they did? They signed a treaty that was one line. We're going to repeal every single tariff we have. 
it went down to zero. Not one, two percent, zero percent. And the consequence of that is eight, nine percent growth every single year since then. And Estonia today is one of the beacons of liberty in the world. I wouldn't say they have gone all the way, but I would say they have gone a lot further than Latin America. So there are many wonderful examples uh, in today's world of free market reform. Uh, it needs political courage, it needs uh, intellectual awareness, uh, it needs to really uh, know where the problem uh, is rooted. Uh, and that's what I think is we're lacking in Latin America. We need to pause just for a minute. My ideal is to simply do away with all sorts of barriers and, and uh, tariffs. Um, um, however, uh, we live in the real world. The real world is a world in which we move in, in, in baby steps. And so if you can persuade me that um, those deals um, generate more trade than the previous situation, uh, then I guess it's something that needs to be supported. Uh, some of these trade deals have not generated uh, more trade in Latin America. I just quoted in my talk the South American common market where we had exactly the opposite position situation. Most of these countries in South America, Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay, etc., in the early 90s uh, got rid of some of these tariffs. And because of the South American common market, those tariffs have come back up again. Um, so I do believe CAFTA probably does away with more tariffs than it creates or, or, or uh, um, raises. Um, uh, however, I do think the problem today is not so much in Latin America, but here. Uh, there is a protectionist sentiment. Uh, people are very paranoid with China. They're very paranoid with India. Uh, they're extremely protectionist uh, against Latin America. And so uh, it's, it's going to be very tough. I think uh, many Democrats, but also many Republicans in Congress, are very scared. And uh, they won't necessarily um, approve of, NAFTA, of CAFTA. Uh, and if they don't, uh, it's certainly uh, impossible for... Uh, the free trade area of the Americas, which is what you were referring to, uh, to um, um, come into existence. However, we really should not uh, lose sight of the um, uh, object, the final objective, which is really to do away with trade barriers. Trade is good per se. It's not good because it's um, um, located in a certain region. It's not good because it simply creates better politi political relations between certain neighbors. Uh, trade is good per se. Uh, the ideal situation in the world would be for every country to import everything and have to export absolutely nothing. <laughs> it, it would mean getting everything for free. Of course, in the real world, it doesn't work like that. We need to export something in order to generate the money, the revenue to import. Um, and so, but if you have that idea in your mind, uh, the idea that the objective of trade is not to export but to import, uh, you will realize that the important thing is not to force your partner to do away with his uh, tariffs, but to do away with your own tariffs. That's, of course, much better if your partner also does away with uh, those tariffs. Uh, the important thing with trade uh, is to do away with tariffs, and those trade deals that create more barriers than they do away with are certainly not good. Uh, rel relative to tariffs, uh I'm of the opinion, and I, I'd like your interpretation, that our president is caught between a rock and a hard pan relative to border movement, uh, particularly at the border with Mexico. And I think in his mind, uh, he envisions this unification of South America, Central America, and North America. And one of the vestiges of that would be more of a free border movement. He's been resistant to closing the borders with severe barriers. And I really think that's his, in, the, in his deep recess of, of his mind, that this is what's at stake for him. Uh, the whole movement and the movement towards a unification of open trade with South America, Central America, and North America. This, of course, to uh, compete on the world market with the European Union China, who's been very, very successful, and India, which is going to come on to be strong as sort of a block. So I would just like some of your thoughts uh, about this. I believe that the movement of peoples are important, and if they have security problems, that these should be dealt with as a separate matter, but not of a closing of the borders. That's my... Well, I don't know if you remember, but uh, when 
President Bush came into power, uh, the first thing he did in terms of foreign policy was to go to Mexico and to signal that he was um, moving towards some type of legalization of, or maybe you know, just giving a, any sort of amnesty to um, Mexicans living here who were um, uh, in a kind of illegal status. Uh, and um, that created a, a very interesting situation in Latin America. Many people thought really that this country was moving towards uh, open borders, at least partially, and that could be the kind of first step towards uh, a more uh, general situation. Uh, and then, of course, 9-11 took place, and that blew everything away. I mean, Latin America just completely was, was blown off from the, the radar screen, and, and nobody took any notice of Latin America until a few months ago when Chavez became an issue. Uh, and now, again, the U.S. is focusing on Latin America because Chavez is an issue. Um, and so um, that, that's important because Latin Americans relate to the United States according to the signals the United States sends to Latin America. And so the idea is that uh, we, were giving, we were given a, a signal or promise that was simply not fulfilled. Um, what is happening today? Uh, is a very, it's a very complicated situation. Uh, I think the government perceives there is a uh, large, I don't know if it's a majority of people here, but maybe a very, very large and influential uh, section of society um, that is totally against uh, anything remotely uh, um, to do with opening the borders and letting immigrants in and, and um, uh, et cetera. So I think it's gonna be, um, probably very hard for President Bush or whoever comes into power next uh, to open the borders. Um, I think it's a mistake. I am in favor of free immigration. Um, I know it's a delicate issue from a, from a purely libertarian point of view because the, really the purely libertarian point of view should be that anybody um, should be allowed to bring an immigrant into their property, but not necessarily into public property, because public property, by definition, is a property that the government has expropriated from others, and therefore, why should we uh, have to pay taxes uh, to sustain um, immigrants coming into public parks or whatever, uh, roads or circulating in roads. But in general, a government or a nation state, to be more precise, that creates barriers against immigration uh, is probably uh, a state that is um, uh, authoritarian, that is um, imposing on its own people uh, choices that those people have not made for themselves. So even though it is true that immigrants coming in and uh, trading on public property are probably the indirect beneficiaries of government action that people have not chosen, it is probably worse uh, to, let, uh, to simply not let people in because that uh, creates a, a form of uh, state power and imposition on people who are living within that country that is, that is even worse. Uh, but it's a very tough issue. I don't think this country is gonna move in the right direction, uh, at least in, in that respect, for, for a long time. People see immigrants as the enemy, they see immigrants as um, uh, people who are taking away from them, not only jobs, but even more important than that, I mean, their identity. Uh, I don't know if you've read um, uh, Samuel Huntington's um, stuff. Uh, he's been coming up with, he's a professor at Harvard, very famous guy. He, he wrote The Clash of Civilizations, and he's been writing books. Uh, and he wrote a book recently called, um, um, uh, uh, I think it was Who We Are, or something like that. And he makes the argument that Latins who are migrating to the United States are uh, hurting the identity of the United States because uh, previous immigrants were of an Anglo-Saxon origin mainly. And they had, uh, of course, uh, certain values that these Latin immigrants are um, in, in some ways uh, um, hurting and threatening. And so I think there is some of that uh, in, in people's minds. There is a thrust in Washington to bring about uh, the Free Trade Area of Americas, the FTAA, as well as, as you mentioned, the uh, CAFTA, and establish uh, uh, a globalism type of, of regional uh, government and regional trade. My question is that every one of the five principles of oppression that you've discussed tonight, uh, 
seems like they were, will be enhanced and, and established in the United States through the FTAA because uh, it's not a free trade, it's a controlled trade, it's a regulated trade, it's a trade of privilege. I'd like your comments on that. Well, if that is true, I'm, I'm with you. Um, anything that creates more privilege, that creates more uh, wealth transfer, that creates more corporatism, um, needs to be opposed. Um, that's why I said uh, some of these trade deals usually do the opposite of what they purport to do. Um, the case in point being the South American common market. I've given many examples today of, of how that um, b became a, a, a form of uh, hampering trade rather than um, um, engineering a, a you know, greater free trade. Um, uh, I think FDAA um, is not going to be possible for, for the time being. I think Brazil, uh, maybe Argentina also, but especially Brazil, uh, is resisting that because Brazil thinks that um, that is something that's going to be controlled by the United States and they think uh, they should um, dominate the South American common market, Brazil I mean, and therefore create a sort of counterweight to the United States and so have two uh, big trading blocks in, in this hemisphere, the NAFTA and then the South American common market. And that's, that's really what Brazil is pushing for. So in that context, I don't really see how it's going to be possible for the United States to uh, push for, for uh, FTAA in any effective way. Um, I think both sides are probably wrong in the sense that the, uh, the best way is really to simply eliminate trade barriers. I mentioned Estonia a moment ago. Other countries in, in, the, in this world, small countries, have simply done away with barriers unilaterally without expecting any, any, anything in return, and the result has been growth. Um, but the truth is um, we're a long way from that in this hemisphere. Uh, we see trade as essentially uh, a zero-sum game, uh, and we see trade as an extension of uh, power politics. And uh, while we continue to see trade as that, it's going to be very hard for countries to realize that the objective of, of, of uh, trade reform is not to extract concessions from your partner, it's simply to eliminate your own barriers. Yeah. Um, I also have a however here. Uh, <laughs> as a you know, Peruvian, I couldn't agree more with your conceptualization of the nature of the problems in Latin America, uh, but as a um, practicing physician in the Bay Area, I believe that the um, healthcare system in this country is a disgrace. It's, an embarrassment. Uh, it, 46 million people are uninsured. It's the most inefficient system in the world, and I think it's the main. You know, the main, I, I think it's well. It's a prime ex example of the failure of the market system. I think um, is basically, I believe, because the uh, um, healthcare industry, the healthcare, the insurance companies are totally unregulated and because greed is a very powerful force too. So I wonder if you see any in your role for some sort of government reg regulation at all to prevent this kind of situations, you know? No. <laughs> I'm not gonna go into that. I'm not an expert in that. There, we have many experts in that, but... Yeah. In, the, uh, in your packet, there's a catalog, and uh, one of our books is a book called American Healthcare, and uh, you might take a look at that because it shows the pervasive effects of government policies in healthcare, similar to what Alvaro has been saying. Has been saying you have this system of pervasive involvement, contradictory policies, essentially redistributing costs to the public and redistributing profits to those who have political influence. So it's not unlike what Alvaro is saying, in, and the image of all this is that somehow it's a market. It's not a market. A, a very important American libertarian called um, Albert J. Nock said many decades ago, he said the, the objective of free market reform should not be to destroy government, but to destroy the prestige of government. And what you just said is, is a case in point. I mean, um, what we have here is a big myth, the idea that government is a solution to problems that markets create, and it's exactly the opposite. Uh, markets are a solution to problems the government create. What you stated today is 
uh, the consequence not of government lack of intervention but of government intervention and uh, I deeply believe that uh, if we uh, did away with some of these uh, uh, intrusions uh, on the part of government uh, the people could create a much better health system uh, I lived in Britain for many years they have a completely nationalized uh, um, healthcare system and believe me it's a complete disaster and if Tony Blair loses the elections in a few days time it'll be probably in part not only because of Iraq but in part because of that he promised when he came into government um, to uh, um, restore the prestige of the uh, healthcare system which he called the national uh, healthcare system in, in, in Britain and it's been impossible because the nature of the beast is the problem not people that manage it or, or uh, are in uh, take care of it yeah Um, you opening with some quotes of uh, Latin American presidents, so I'm going to use the same thing. Okay. You allow me. Porfirio Diaz, last century, he says, poor Mexico, so close to the U.S., so far away from God. <laughs> then Mr. Monroe came and said, America for the Americans. Then in Mexico, we have this saying that when the U.S. get a flu, get pneumonia. <laughs> What's the, and you talk about, of all the Spaniard heritage, all that corruption came from Spain, that's in every single book, uh, even Spain's admitted. Anyway, what's the positive and negative, especially, of the influence in the, the, of the U.S. in the rest of Latin America, and how, if it's true or not, that has stopped or economical development of Latin America? I don't think the United States is responsible for the underdevelopment of, of Latin America. Uh, if that were true, Hong Kong would not be a, a powerful uh, a region of the world today. It was a colony. I mean, a colony. Not a, we're not a colony. We're under, of course, a big influence from the United States, but they were actually a colony from Britain. And because they um, exercised the right kind of uh, policies and cultural attitudes, they were uh, able to become incredibly prosperous. So prosperous that today, despite China, uh, being in control of Hong Kong, they are still very prosperous. Um, however, uh, the United States has made many mistakes in Latin America. Of course they have. Uh, we've gone from um, um, uh, direct uh, interventionism um, to what I call condescension, policies that uh, based uh, basically, the, I mean, the, the whole ideal of uh, good relations uh, with uh, the southern neighbors on foreign aid. Uh, and uh, that simply didn't work. In the 70s, uh, billions and billions and billions of dollars of foreign aid poured into Latin America. The result was uh, the level of, of investment was uh, very small, about 16% of GDP. Um, growth was about 0.5%, 0.5% uh, in per capita terms, uh, per head. Uh, in the 80s, uh, as I said, uh, capital went out of Latin America uh, at a much faster rate than it went in because of foreign aid. Um, and so um, uh, both uh, intervention and condescension uh, have been totally useless. Uh, today we have a situation in which um, there are a, a few manifestations of uh, uh, U.S. power in the region that I think are not very... Uh, very good. Uh, the drug war, I think, is a, is a complete disaster. Uh, I, I think we'll have to wait a few decades before people realize here what a disaster it is, just as it took a few decades for people to realize prohibition was a disaster. These things take time. Um, I think the U.S. could do a lot more for Latin America just simply by uh, uh, opening up trade in this market, uh, getting rid of all those barriers that... Uh, um, um, uh, are an obstacle to trade, uh, to exports from Latin America uh, to uh, the United States. Uh, but still, the bottom line is, if we do the right thing, even considering uh, the uh, inadequacies of U.S. policy, we could still move ahead, we could still uh, prosper, as other countries have, have, have done. Uh, so I, I never place the blame for Latin America's underdevelopment in the United States. I'm sorry, you've asked a question already. I'm, there are a lot of people. Please, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You've mentioned uh, fi 500 years, and probably more, counting the Aztecs and the Incas, yeah. that people have been imbued with the kind of a structure that, that you've talked about tonight. Uh, 
if all of a sudden all of the ministers and the presidents of all the countries in Latin America were had were populated by people like yourself with your beliefs, how long do you think it would take to in, to change the structure in Latin America? Okay, that's an impossibility, but. Um, <laughs> It's not, it doesn't take very long for a country today, in today's world, globalized world, uh, to prosper. Uh, um, I think it's true of any era that a country that did the right thing would eventually prosper. In today's world, uh, it's, 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 it's very quick. We've seen countries that, I mean, even Chile, Chile in the 70s. Uh, I'm talking about before the Pinochet era, I mean, under Allende and, and all these people. It was a complete disaster. More than half the population was under the poverty line. It was a country that people simply uh, um, um, wrote off completely. Uh, and in one generation, it's become a country that everybody talks about as a model of reform. Um, and uh, I think that shows, and they have um, Hispanic heritage, they have uh, pre-Columbian heritage, uh, they have migration from all sorts of places. I mean, they're really a, a microcosm uh, uh, in today's world, uh, and uh, they have much fewer resources, re natural resources than Argentina, Peru, Bolivia, all the countries that surround Chile. Uh, they have a population of 15 mil million people, uh, about almost half of my own country, and they're doing so much better. Uh, why? Because today's world uh, allows any country that does the right thing to prosper. As long as you do the right thing, you need a consensus, a certain amount of consensus in society, at least uh, you know among the leadership, and, and you need uh, a lot of political vision and courage. And they had that uh, at the right time, uh, and uh, and they're moving ahead. They need to do a lot better than that. Uh, they're not yet there, but um, uh, I think it, it simply shows that it's possible for any country in Latin America, given the heritage, given the um, geographical, natural resources, given the uh, um, um, historic period that we're, we're in um, to uh, achieve success. That's about, a very encouraging story. How about two more questions? Uh, staying on, on Chile for a second, um, um, that is, seems to be the only real example of um, rapid progress um, in Latin America and it was essentially imposed by what a lot of people would consider to be a very brutal dictatorship. So my question to you is do you think that's the only way towards a market approach or can a democratic process produce the same kind of result? No, I don't think that at all. In fact, um, Chile is doing much better since it got rid of Pinochet in 89. Um, the democratic system, uh, I, I don't like the idea of de democracy as majoritism in the sense that whatever the majority thinks is right um, um, uh, should be imposed. Uh, but uh, I think as a contrast to the very authoritarian regime of Pinochet, it's an interesting example, um, has done much better than the dictatorship. Uh, you've had uh, a monumental reduction in poverty in Chile, uh, not under Pinochet, but under um, either Christian Democratic or Socialist government, not because they were Christian Democratic or Socialist, but because simply they uh, were uh, a lot more in favor of free markets than most other Latin American uh, nations. Um, so no, I don't think you need to go through Pinochet, uh, which is exactly the opposite of what you need um, to have freedom. Uh, Pinochet was, what was Pinochet about? He was about concentration of power, about the abolition of civil liberties. He was about the invasion of people's uh, um, uh, sovereignty. Uh, he was all about um, expropriating decision-making power from individuals. Uh, except that he had, I don't, I, not even the vision, he simply had the luck to have uh, advisors that uh, knew a lot more than he did about the economy and opened up certain spaces in the economy. And so that generated a lot of wealth. Um, uh, that's the wonderful thing about liberty. Even if a tyrant opens up a few spaces for liberty, uh, people will immediately, immediately react. That's what happened in Singapore. That's what happened in South Korea. All of those were dictatorships and brutal dictatorships. They're not anymore. They have gone towards more civilian uh, types of government. But uh, even under communist China today, uh, 
uh, we have a good portion of the population that is responding in positive ways to the uh, new spaces that have opened up uh, to them. Uh, so what does that, does, does that mean that dictatorships uh, work? No. It means that people work despite dictatorships. It means that uh, even if you have a brutal system that violates human rights and kills people for what they think and that suppresses uh, uh, freedom of opinion, uh, even if that type of government uh, leaves people enough space um, to conduct their own affairs, at least in the economy, uh, in the way they see fit, then that will produce results. That's a testament for freedom, not for tyranny. Yeah. Please. The way I understand it, um, a group of free market economists from the University of Chicago went down to Chile and essentially taught the people running the government, how to set up a free market system. And what do you think of the idea that instead of all this NAFTA, CAFTA, FTAA, and the rest of this socialist stuff, we had free market groups like the Independent Institute going into various Latin American nations to the governments and just teaching them how to set up a free market system in their own nation? Well, yes, uh, the Chilean system, uh, well, yes, it, what they did is they imported some um, scholars from uh, Chicago, um, except that it wasn't quite that way. What happened was the socialist system just simply collapsed. There was hyperinflation. I've lived in, under hyperinflation in Peru, and I, I can tell you it's a, it's, a, it's a very desperate state of affairs. Um, they lived under a situation in which nobody was uh, at all secure uh, in uh, the property or anything. Uh, nobody could take for granted absolutely anything, I mean, just from one day to the other. So under that type of chaos, um, it's of course understandable that even Pinochet would call people and say, well, if you think you know what you're doing, then go ahead. And then that was a, you know, a, a unique case in history in which uh, people like Jose Piñera, who is around today giving lectures on the privatization of the state pension system and so on, uh, had a chance to do some other stuff. Uh, but I think it's very important to understand that uh, dictatorships in Latin America have not usually uh, achieved these results. They have achieved exactly the opposite results. Um, about the uh, independent institute uh, advising Latin American governments, well, that's what we do. We put out all sorts of literature. We uh, put together events like these, and hopefully these ideas will catch on. And uh, tour. Well, and m my little tour around Latin America, and hopefully one day uh, these ideas will uh, be there when people become very desperate, and they look around and say, well, uh, we've tried almost everything. Uh, hopefully they will... Uh, look at these ideas and, and think, well, maybe, might, maybe we need to give them a chance. I might just add that the new center that Alvaro is going to be directing is, is aimed at uh, doing studies and having communications programs to demonstrate how uh, enterprise-based approaches uh, have this enormous track record in relieving uh, abject poverty and creating wealth for people on the lowest rungs of society and all the way, all the way through society. Uh, okay, I just have a question about uh, South America, and then, a, and then a second question about economics. Uh, my first question is about, uh, in Argentina, I think you've seen, like, uh, the last two years they had about five presidents in two years, and then in, in Ecuador they had, like, eight presidents, or they've had about eight presidents within the last ten years, and then in Bolivia they just uh, changed presidents, like, uh, several times. And I was wondering, I just wanted to get your comments on that, and then also on Peru, and it seemed like that didn't really happen in Peru. It seems like they kind of stick with the same, with the same uh, people in power. And I was, I was very curious about that, and I wanted to get your thoughts on that. And then my, my last question on economics was, um, why, uh, when you go to the stores everywhere, you see everything that's made in China, and that's really great, and it's really, it's really great for Taiwan and everything, but how come, you know, uh, do you think that maybe Latin America or Africa has have not been given the opportunity to uh, to get into uh, those markets to make basic things like just combs and just anything? And that was just you know, so. Well, uh, yes, we, we we tend to uh, change governments uh, overnight just for nothing, for no uh, real reason. 
but my point is usually not about instability in Latin America, but about exactly the opposite, stability. Uh, the important thing is to realize these are all power struggles. It's all power politics. Underneath what you have is the same types of rules, the t same types of institutions, and the same types of systems. So let's not be confused by these changes, abrupt changes of government and, and sudden revolutions that uh, seem to overturn everything. What we have is a basic structural system, a basic system of uh, incentives, a basic system of structuring human interaction and human relations that is a complete disaster. And we need to uh, get rid of that. And these changes of government uh, don't, don't even touch that. I mean, they are simply superficial uh, power struggles. And, and so let's, let's look beyond these. Um, uh, as far as uh, the U.S. market, uh, well, yes, there have been a lot of barriers to Latin American uh, uh, exports uh, in, in the U.S., um, but I don't think that um, Chinese products becoming popular in the U.S. are a threat to Latin America. I think they're uh, uh, exactly the opposite because uh, we are benefiting from that too. Some of these products are coming into Latin America and they're selling at much better prices than our own products are selling at home. And so these Chinese products are helping consumers, poor consumers in shanty towns, acquire good quality products, and uh, they're having some money left for other endeavors. Uh, so I think it's very important to realize that trade is never a zero-sum game. Uh, I know that it's, it's the tendency is to look at trade as a war in which you either win or lose. Trade is always a situation in which you win, even if you don't export anything to that country. It simply means you're exporting to other countries, you're making money from that, and then you're in a position to buy from China, in this case, products that uh, are very cheap and good quality. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, um, would you ever consider going back to Peru and running for president? <laughs> I have been there already, and it's, it's, it's not worth it. I've, I've, <laughs> We need to win the battle of ideas before uh, uh, we, can, we can really uh, make change possible. And uh, it was a mistake on the part of many people who think like me uh, to think that they could um, create change before we could win the battle of ideas. So um, this is where I am now. I'm much more comfortable here. And uh, this is where I'll continue to be for a long time. How about one last question? Back there. I've learned so much from you. I'd like your opinion on uh, Venezuela. Um, it appears from a leftist perspective that Hugo Chavez enjoys immense popularity among the workers and peasants. And three weeks ago, they held a uh, conference, international conference, and they talked about oil. Now, uh, Venezuela is supposed to have the largest oil reserves in the world, and they will be selling to China and to uh, India both. And in the province of uh, Aqualinda, uh, 18,000 hectares of spare land has been given, idle land has been given to workers and peasants who, who wish to develop it. Um, how do you see the prosperity? Oh, and, and uh, Venezuela wishes to open a bank of the south, as they call it, to counteract the uh, World Bank and IMF. What do you think the prospects for a successful... Um, change in, in Venezuela with their Bolivarian revolution? I thought I was going to be spared a question about Hugo Chavez, but I <laughs> um, I mentioned at the beginning of my talk uh, some of these uh, uh, delusional uh, presidents in Latin America. I forgot to mention Chavez, uh, who, uh, well, if you ever go to interview Chavez, you will find out that in his office he has three chairs, and he sits in one chair, of course, you as an uh, interviewer would sit in the other one, in, in the second chair, and then there's a third chair that's left empty. And he says that's for the ghost of Bolivar, who was the peer of Latin Americans yeah. independence in the 19th century. And he sees, well, Bolivar, he says, Bolivar is watching uh, to make sure that interview is fair. So that's how delusional this guy is. Um, no, Chavez is not a left-wing man. He's the most reactionary politician you can imagine. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Venezuela. Uh, they had, a, between 1958 and 1998, they had what they call a democratic system, a system in which people would elect a new government, and, and yes, there was a, a certain amount of power sharing. Uh, basically, two parties. It was a, a 
uh, a system in which two parties had the control of the political system. Um, that was a system that depended on oil almost entirely. Uh, throughout that period, uh, Venezuela um, earned about um, 400 billion dollars uh, uh, in oil money, which was a lot of money. Uh, and uh, well, they simply had a very mercantilistic corporatist system uh, uh, based on privilege. Uh, and so the result was a lot of poverty. That um, country went from having a per capita income, which was the equivalent of 70% of the per capita income in the United States, taking into account, of course, the, uh, a purchasing power parity, uh, to having a, a half the population under the poverty line. So the result was Chavez, of course, uh, in the shanty towns around Caracas, what they call ranchos in Venezuela. People took to the streets and said, we want a change, we want revolution. And so Chavez came about. First, he engineered a typical reactionary right-wing coup in 1992. He failed. He went to jail. He came out of jail. He became a national hero, and he became president in 1998. He was elected in a democratic elections. So what has he done since? He has done exactly the same that the previous governments did. He has relied on oil. When he came into power, the price of a barrel was $8. Now it's over 50, so you can imagine the amount of revenue that's coming in to his coffers. And these, these are his, his personal, personal coffers. This is not uh, uh, money for the Venezuelan people. And so what is he doing? He's, uh, well, uh, creating a system of, of huge political patronage. He's buying off people here and there. I was there, I've been there many times since he came into power, almost, f I think, five times. I was there in August during the recall referendum. I was there a few weeks ago, again, presenting this book. Um, so I, I know what I'm talking about. I've talked to people, and he's simply doing exactly what was done before, relying on oil money, um, uh, persecuting the opposition, creating a system of fear, and buying off people because he has a lot of oil money. Um, and so I think it's very important to realize that beyond the rhetoric, uh, what you have is a system in place that is uh, simply reproducing uh, some of the revolutions we had in Latin America before. The Mexican Revolution at the beginning of the uh, 20th century, the Bolivian Revolution in 1952, the Cuban Revolution in 1959, the Peruvian Revolution in 1968, etc. The, of course, the Sandinista Revolution in Nicaragua in 1979. And all of these revolutions did exactly the same thing. Now, uh, as far as um, uh, taking land idle, land, you called it, and giving it to the poor, that is not quite true. He's taking land that is owned by certain people. Um, the last thing he did when I was there, he expropriated some very uh, fertile land that belonged to a British company. And what he's doing is not giving that land to the people. He's giving it to government bureaucrats uh, under the guise of redistribution of land. And the uh, um, uh, handling of that land by government bureaucrats uh, will end up being a, a, a sort of repetition of what happened in Peru in 1968, in uh, um, uh, Cuba in 1959, in uh, Bolivia in 1952. It'll be simply a way of destroying agriculture in that country because there are no property rights. Nobody is secure in his property. Um, it's a system in which there is no uh, economic calculation. Uh, it is simply a tool for politicians uh, to generate votes and to generate uh, uh, clientele, political clienteles. And so, uh, so let's not fall into that trap. Uh, Chavez is not a left-wing revolutionary. He is a reactionary. Um, he's an extreme reactionary who is uh, doing the most conservative thing you can possibly do in Latin America, if you understand, understand the term conservative, by simply preserving the status quo. Thank you. I know that many of you um, have questions uh, still for Alvaro, um, and he will be here. Um, we welcome you to come up and, and discuss them with him. Those of you who have not gotten either the Spanish or English or both copies of his book, um, there are copies upstairs. We encourage you to do so, and he'd be delighted to autograph them for you. Yeah, he'll be autographing them right here, and the, the uh, table is right upstairs. Um, I want to thank Alvaro again for his work. Uh, it's been a real privilege to work on, with him, and we look forward to many years of doing that in the future. And thank you all for joining with us in making tonight so successful.
We look forward to your joining with us again. Thank you and good night.